Is a non-killing society possible? Is it possible to have a society in which human beings do not kill each other? The book, Non-Killing Global Political Science, concludes with this last word, yes. I'm blessed by being a part of humanity that's really dedicated within itself so that not one of us is going to be killed. Forty people from 22 countries gathered here in 2007 to attend the first global non-killing forum. This book is a classic. This book, with its pragmatic ideas, has ignited hope around the world. After just three years in print, it's been translated into 26 languages in over 40 countries. This historic conference was both a testament of the global impact of Professor Page's book and of the universal quest for true, lasting peace based on nonviolence. Here, political scientists, peace activists, religious leaders, and a Nobel laureate all met to envision ways to create a future based on non-killing. I did not choose non-killing. It came to me in three words, no more killing, about 1974. After I'd been involved in the Korean War and I'd been closely involved with Korean affairs and I'd seen the results of killing, just one day, silent words came to me, just no more killing. So after that, all right, I began to re-educate myself about killing and about violence and about war. Non-killing is a different approach. It's not just peace studies, it's not just anti-globalization, not just the, the environmental struggles or, or the ethnic struggles or the genocide struggles or the war peace struggles. It, it covers all of them, but it just looks at it a different way. The media gives us a ne very negative image about war happening here and there and all the kind of killing that's going on. But that's just one small side of the story. Really what's exciting are individuals and people who are struggling and trying to make sense of this world and are trying to do a variety of things using nonviolent means. You can all be for peace. I mean, Hitler fought for peace. I mean, that was what he was after. And so did Stalin and the whole, everyone, everyone's for peace. All the Christian churches are for peace and, and, and all the na nations, everybody's for peace. But peace with what? Non-killing peace is very important because you know peace is used by various people, and peace is used by people who have a lot of military power, and you know, and people also who don't mind that and that using that military power. There's a lot of collateral damage, but we are talking about non-killing peace, and that, that's that's what differentiates us from anyone else. I would say that violence comes out of unresolved conflict. So if you want killing to go develop the skills of solving conflicts. Every human being, I think, is keen to be closer to other human beings. If we take 10 people or 100 people, they may have 100 different ideas, you know. Different ideas means uh, differences uh, of opinion, conflicts and all that. At the same time, all these people will have a common problem say they don't have sufficient water, clean and adequate supply of water. Call all this 100 people, look, we are thirsty. Let's go and dig wells, build them up so that we can have clean water. They join together and all those hundreds of different ideas disappear. They focus on one thing, clean and adequate supply of water. Then at the end of it, maybe 100 different ideas can get reduced to maybe 25, 30. The more you get people to work together, the more opportunities you have to 
come together even in thought. Non-violence, non-killing, is love. It's love. You, you can change someone with the investment of love that you, you make on him. It's not all about talking. You can go beyond talking to do things in tangible ways, in specific ways to try to affect the life of someone. Over the last three decades, through the power of dialogue, respect, and understanding, Dr. Page has helped foster critical thinking about nonviolence, and specifically non-killing. Just as the world's major religions began in extremely violent societies, readers of the book are forming centers of non-killing in societies overwhelmed by violence, in places like Haiti, Colombia, Sri Lanka, Nigeria, the Congo, Rwanda, and Burundi. In these countries, shackled with the staggering social and economic costs of violence, local leaders have organized seminars to explore the ideas expressed in Dr. Page's book. As in this Tutsi village of Biboko Boko in Congo's Great Lakes region. Is a non-killing society possible? Just only this book and only this book that helps us to teach and conduct our trainings in the Rwanda, Burundi, and the Congo Democratic Republic. In Haiti, as in the Congo, another center for global nonviolence was formed, modeled after the one page founded in Honolulu in the 1980s. Dialogues among such groups have sprung up all over the world, and Glenn Page and his center have been an inspiration for all of them. Somehow they find this non-killing, let's say, uh, an email I got yesterday says, you have opened up new horizons for us. Non-killing is a different way. The UN Health Organization's landmark book, The World Report on Violence and Health, 2002, concluded that killing is an international disease and a curable one. The book, Non-Killing Global Political Science, was published exactly the same time. And both say the same thing. This World Health Organization comes to the conclusion Killing is a curable disease. And a book, Non-Killing Global Political Science, comes out and says exactly the same thing. Human beings can't stop killing each other. Here's 249 pages from the question, is it possible, up to yes, it is possible, and it has to be uh, uh, solved in a global way. Both things converge in the same year, in the beginning of the 21st century. It's very exciting. Terrorism has already established itself as a major problem of the 21st century. It poses threats that simply cannot be solved by military force. We've been killing murderers uh, for, uh, you know, centuries. It doesn't stop murder, homicide, not war. Look, we've been, we've been fighting wars for peace hundreds and hundreds of years, and we're still fighting war in the 21st century. We still see it as a viable option. 19 men with box cutters and some planning and so forth can terrorize a whole 290 million people. There's something wrong with the logic of that. No killing of terrorists will end terrorism. Killing terrorists creates martyrs. Their relatives or the people that know them, they're just as outraged as the people who are the victims of their terrorism. So in Islam, there is no space, no place for terrorism. And those who commit terrorism in the name of religion uh, they are uh, not, you know, f real follower of the faith. We feel bad when see that uh, the Muslim people, the terrorists, they are fighting, they are uh, acting in the name of religion and saying that we are working for jihad. It's not, it's wrong interpretation. Jihad means you kill your evil forces remaining inside. It's wrong. You, you have to fight for inju against injustice. You have to fight for truth. That's the true meaning of jihad. 
Terrorism basically is psychological warfare. The terrorist is working on the mind of the society or the group or the family or whoever you want to terrorize. And the terrorist is a weaker person, very weak, and, and confronting something that's very powerful. So since terrorism is the mind, the cure or the alternative to terrorism is in the mind of the terrorist. Mm -hmm. So you cannot impose anti-terrorism into the throats of the people. People have to be educated, the women have to be empowered, and, and the Puritan religious class has to be confronted. The madrasas, the religious seminaries, uh, they gave Puritan Islamic uh, lessons to the people, prepared people for the so-called jihad, and now that kind of spirit is still there. But the society and the government both are now taking initiatives to see that this tendency is curbed. You have to have empathy with terrorists. They're just human beings like the rest of us. Have empathy. Why are they doing that? And really try to understand that. And since 9-11, a lot of people have been asking that question and they've been trying to understand this and, and why that uh, uh, bin Laden group are doing what they're doing. And the same way, uh, the people around the world, they have to understand the Bush uh, the Bush administration, their group, why are they doing what they're doing? Nonviolence is a serious political uh, method of solving deep ethnic political conflicts. I mean, it's a tragic thought that we don't teach nonviolence non and peace, yet we have all over the world ministries of defense and we teach war. I think that's very sad reflection on our uh, our humanity that we, we ha are still at that stage. People are picking up on that kind of vision at this time in the 21st century where all that killing and preparation to kill is becoming less and less practical. As long as you, as you maintain the right to kill or threaten to kill for justice, equality, uh, uh, markets, opening, uh, defense, whatever it is, uh, we're, we're continuing this. But if you're working toward a non-killing society, you want a society where nobody's killed. You want a zero body count. If you want to save the lives, you have to save the minds. And that's why he talks about non-violent political science. I immediately decided that this is the kind of book which is needed in Pakistan and which is needed in the Muslim societies. The problem was that it was published from a center which focuses on nonviolence, and nonviolence is not a very popular term in our political vocabulary. Nonviolence gets related to Mahatma Gandhi, and Gandhi is a villain in Pakistan. Gandhi did not begin his work in India. He began his work in South Africa by addressing human rights issues, one uh, human family. So uh, he is both probably national, much more than that he was uh, global and international in his reach, in his vision. I was invited to Colombia, uh, to Medellin, by the uh, culture, the, the government. And so I introduced the Martin Luther King trainers, Dr. Bernard Lafayette, Jr., and Captain Charles Alphen, the associates of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, especially Dr. Lafayette. Martin Luther King believed that every person And they've been training around the world, uh, Kingian the methods of nonviolence. So I introduced them to the people in Medellin, they came down to Colombia, and uh, we organized some of training programs for them. They're very successful. 2002, Governor Gaviria of uh, Antioquia Department in Colombia, elected governor, 39 years old. He became uh, committed to G Gandhi, Jesus, and Martin Luther King's uh, nonviolence. So here's a governor, an elected governor, 
who had been studying Gandhi before, was very much interested in nonviolence, and his approach to Columbia's problems is that it had to be settled nonviolently. The FARC had been stealing coffee from the, from the people of Caicedo. The total amount of coffee stolen was like 500 million Colombian pesos. We were in Medellin and we didn't know anything about this, but the journalists called Governor Gaviria and told, Governor Gaviria, you know what happened? The FARC stole the coffee and, they did, and Governor Gaviria said, okay, what, what are you going to do? He said, I am going to organize a march to Kaiser. In Colombia's province or department of Antioquia, 65 miles from its capital of Medellin, is the town of Casado. We have been actively training in uh, Colombia through Luis Patero's connection with a private uh, NGO. And after Governor Gaviria was elected um, governor, uh, we had already trained over uh, 70, 80 people certified, and he was, uh, he was uh, committed to bring those people in uh, with the people, the additional people that he would like to have trained. So he kept it going and saw the vision and continued the Training of Trainers program that we had started prior to his being elected as governor of Antioquia. And he was always listening to Dr. Lafayette and, and inquiring what would Dr. King do, and he was reading a lot of Dr. King's books. He began to, to see how he could make a, a statement. And as I recall, the five days came from Selma to Montgomery, where it took him five days to march. And, and so I was impressed with how he listened, and very intensely, of the people who disagreed with him, who said the march should not go, it was too dangerous. And that was, uh, I can remember him very deep in thought about uh, this march and he even brought his cabinet in and one day his cabinet was sitting around and he would ask every one of them, people in his cabinet, what they thought. Most of them were against it. He led a march into uh, guerrilla territory, 65 miles from Medellin, the capital of Antioquia, in five-day march, got within two miles of the town, uh, the coffee growing town he was trying to reach, going through guerrilla territory. He wanted to uh, dialogue with the guerrillas and with the assumption that Colombia's problems can't be solved only by violence and killing each other. We'd have to uh, negotiate. The thing that was so impressive is that not only did the scouts go ahead a week before, but there was a sort of like a courier who went ahead to get the school children to come out and join the march and to sing a song. We also had our international people who were coming for the conference, and they came in early enough to uh, join the march, like uh, Glenn Page was one of those who was able to join, participate in the march. Uh, Dr. Luann Guanson was another person, and we had a number from the U.S., people from the U.S. who came and joined us and that kind of thing. Can you imagine uh, a, a president of a country uh, or any, any, uh, any political leader in the world trying to lead like Gandhi or Martin Luther King uh, in the political era. That is really spectacular. Each time we would go to a town, we'd be greeted by the residents of that town and the children would come out and sing. They had displays, they had signs. And then some people would join us. At every place we went, there were some people who just simply decided to join the march. So the numbers continued to swell as we went along. Alguna gente se preguntará, el gobernador de Antioquia en medio de tantos problemas, ¿cómo es que cree que tiene cinco días para caminar? Porque esta caminata no, no es eh, exclusivamente una caminata, no es una marcha. Estamos utilizando esta marcha como un vehículo para 
transportar un mensaje muy valioso, un mensaje que creo yo tiene la fuerza suficiente para transformar la realidad de la cultura violenta del, del pueblo antioqueño. Yo creo que está calando lentamente como calan eh, todos los procesos que buscan la transformación de la cultura. Eh, un proceso muy difícil es el de transformar la cultura de la violencia en medio de la cual nos hemos acostumbrado a vivir. Entonces yo no tengo expectativas de que esto cale instantáneamente ni que produzca transformaciones mágicas. Sé que es un proceso largo. Entiendan que lo que estamos proponiendo es una alternativa, no la inventé yo. Tiene dos mil años. La vida de Jesucristo es el mensaje de la no violencia. 1900 años después Gandhi liberó a la India de la opresión del, del imperio británico con base en la no violencia y Martin Luther King transformó la historia de la humanidad, derrotó el racismo. Yo creo que es una herramienta que es capaz de transformar la lucha social en Colombia. We drove up to meet Dr. Lafayette and Governor Gavilli and the people marching, and we were informed that they had received a letter from the FARC that uh, had threatened them and said that March should not go into Casado. And so there was a strategy session there that day, uh, on Saturday, of what to do and how to do it. For those of us who've been trained in the nonviolent movement, there is only one fear that you have and that is that your work will not continue after you're gone but when you have your you know organization you have your structure you have people who are trained then there's no fear that you won't get the job done because there are others who will make sure that the work continues the day before, actually, we were marching together, the governor and myself, and we had received a threat. And uh, so I said to the governor, as the two of us were walking, you know, in front of the line, I said, now I already know who, you know, is going to keep things going for me in case if something happens to me. That's already set. You know, Charles is going to make sure that this, you know, training goes on and our movement continues, you know, the work that I've been doing. So I said, who do you have in mind to take your place? And he said, of course, you know, Yolanda, she's very committed, his wife, to this work and she will not let it die. She will keep this movement going. While we were there at the city limits, the FARC met us with AK-47s escorted us up the hill. If you have an enemy, as the, the Gandhian thing, if you have a hated enemy, you're supposed to reach them and you're supposed to have a dialogue with them. You're supposed to meet them as human beings and lay out your case and go back. That's the Gandhian uh, method. So is it the method of Martin Luther King. The enemy is you, in a sense. You're part of the problem, but you have to meet your enemy and you have to in the human scale, you have to get in contact, and I imagine that's what basically he was trying to do. The idea was that if the priest and the, the bishop and all of us go up there together, they could see that we come in peace. My position was bring El Paiso here. You don't take anybody. We're going to the cameras, the international people protect us. Well, we got so far and they decided that they uh, were going to separate and only take four of us. As we were walking through rugged area, the members of the FARC were dressed with uh, rubber boots and they had their fatigue uniform. They had a machete 
and they had uh, I think another maybe smaller knife and then they had the AK-47 they were all arms with AK-47 and there were women and men both and um, they had the guns drawn on us so we realized then that it was not a normal situation and they said well they said, well, how long is it going to take to, to, before we get to the people we're going to meet with? They said, well, it may have to be overnight, you know. So that's when it dawned upon us, okay? The curtain was pulled down, and uh, it, was, it was a nightmare because we were kidnapped. He had ordered the police and the army not to protect the march, and if he were kidnapped or killed, not to retaliate and not to rescue him. In those kind of situations, you go in with the, the power of your soul. So nonviolence is not an insurance policy, but nonviolence gives you uh, some options that can possibly uh, change the dynamics. I stayed in custody, I don't know how long, I can remember, it was late, it was that night. Quarter three to eight thirty. To that night, when we got, uh, uh, they finally decided to uh, release me, they got the word. Because a Baisal got on the cell phone and they were talking to people because they had to reassemble all five heads of the FARC. They got five top people who were the head leaders and all five of them had to be put on a conference call to make a decision about what they were going to do with me. So they finally decided that they were going to release me. So it was a strange feeling I never forget because the priest is the one that told me. He said, you're free. And to hear the words that you're free was a strange kind of thing. And you know, I've been in jail before, you know, and that kind of thing, etc. But to hear these words that you're free, it was imagining like it would be in the Emancipation Proclamation when the slaves were freed. It's a kind of a stunning thing, a thought, a feeling that you would come over you. Because I never thought of myself as not being free. The governor was kidnapped for over a year until May 5, 2003, when he and others were killed by the FARC during a failed rescue attempt by the Colombian Army. He kept a diary throughout his captivity, expressing his unwavering belief in nonviolence for the well-being of Colombia and the world. Hoy van más de cinco años y, y no volvió. Aquí me quedé esperándolo. Lo peor de todo es que no va a volver. Del secuestro hay dos cosas que también quedaron muy grabadas en mi mente. La primera imagen en la prueba de supervivencia en un video que enviaron las FARC. Al pueblo colombiano desde las montañas de la patria. Más o menos a los ocho o nueve meses de estar secuestrado Guillermo que lo veo por primera vez después de que me lo habían quitado, con barba, nunca había usado barba, con bigote. Eh, esa sensación me impactó. 
su mirada era una mirada per, como perdida, de profunda tristeza, como que con los ojos me decía, necesito salir de acá. Esa es una imagen que jamás se borra de mi mente. The critical point of the match is not in that moment. It's not because they were kidnapped. The critical point is because Gordon of Gaviria and Dr. Echeverry got killed. In my opinion, there are four reasons that they have different weights. The first one is that we took a risk. We know it was going to be dangerous. We made a votation. We lost the votation. We decided that we, are, we were going to Caicedo. And we took a risk. The second point is that we were not prepared for the plan B. We should have planned in advance what happened. What, what are we going to do if they are retained or kidnapped? In advance. And we were surprised. The third uh, cause that made a contribution to the killing is that we abandoned our strategy. After that, we never talk about non-violence again. In fact, non-violence was considered the, the, the worst thing. It was considered the possibility, and I was called very bad names because people felt I was the responsible one. But there is one fourth cause of the killing, and is that the central government tried to rescue them. And they made a lot of mistakes. They, the army told President Uribe that they knew the exact point in, in which they were, it, that, and they knew the El Paisa, who was the leader, the other were very young, and we knew that because of the letter that we were receiving, uh, was, uh, wasn't there on, on Mondays, because he, he, he had that they free, I, I don't know why, but he wasn't there on Mondays, and they knew he was on vacation for several days, so he said, we have to attack Monday, the 5th of May, because he is on vacation and he never is there on Mondays. So if we get there and we have a very well-trained team, the elite, and they are going to get down in two minutes, so th those young people are not, uh, are not able, they will not be able to kill those people because they, 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 are, they feel respect for them, isn't it? But if you read Governor Gaviria's book, then you will know that Go El Paisa returned one week in advance, and they didn't know. The, the, the El Paisa returned one week before the, the, the killing. Secondly, they missed the, the exact place for, by half an hour. The army, uh, with the helicopters, they did a lot of noise, and the people of the farm knew that they were coming, and they didn't land it in the exact point, they did half an hour away. So the fact had the, all the time to kill everybody and they leave. No one single member of the FARC was caught or even injured because they didn't have even the opportunity to try to shoot at them. That operation wasn't very well planned. And in my opinion, that is the main cause that got Governor Gaviria and Dr. Echeverri killed. Con el asesinato de Guillermo por parte de las FARC, se perdió en Colombia una esperanza. Yo creo que muchos colombianos y colombianas sintieron una frustración a algo que empezaba en Colombia a sembrarse, que era la semilla de la no violencia. Sin embargo, pues la muerte de Guillermo a la vez hizo que esa semilla empezara a germinar. La tarea que nos queda después de la muerte de Guillermo es seguir abonando esa semilla de la no violencia para que ella dé frutos en, todos los, en, en, en el corazón de muchos colombianos y podamos empezar a caminar un camino, a transitar un camino de entendimiento, un camino de no violencia, un camino que nos permita construir soluciones sociales juntos sin necesidad de odiarnos y sin necesidad de matarnos. And I told him, I haven't ever organized a march, but I'm going to tell you what theory says. In non-violence, we don't allow violence to be done. People ask, do you have to be willing to die to be a non-violent leader? I think an answer to that would be yes. Are you willing to die to be a soldier? 
Are you willing to die to be a policeman? Are you willing to die to be a, a, a president of the United States? So a person risking their life uh, for, for nonviolent reasons a little bit different in that uh, they're not intending to kill other people in order to save their life. That's the basic idea. They're willing to risk their life uh, for good causes, not just run out to be a martyr or get yourself killed. They're not doing that. They're working on social, economic injustices, ecological injustice, working for human rights and trying to change the society and trying to, trying to create a better world. The most important message I think that we would want to say from Northern Ireland is that militarism and paramilitarism don't solve deep ethnic political problems. The only way of solving these problems is indeed through non-violence, through no killing, through dialogue, through negotiation. And it takes time, but it is doable. Es tan urgente y necesario construir caminos de no violencia que yo creo que el mundo está hoy equivocadísimo en la manera de atacar concretamente el terrorismo. En la medida en que se invierten más recursos, en que se actúa con mayor fuerza frente al terrorismo, el terrorismo crece en el mundo. Guillermo Gaviria is a nonviolent figure as important to humanity and civilization as Gandhi or Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King believed that every person was capable of doing the greatest good as well as the greatest evil, but the person is not evil, it's their deeds. And the goal of nonviolence is that you bring the good out of others. And the way you do that is you recognize the things that are not so good in yourself, you become more sympathetic toward those others. Martin Luther King said to me uh, the last day uh, of his life in Memphis, Tennessee, the Rain Hotel, April 4th, but these were the last words he said to me. He said, Bernard, what we must do now is to institutionalize and we must internationalize movement and nonviolence. And I can say that uh, Glenn Page has helped me to carry out Martin Luther King's dream by giving me these assignments to go into all the world. There's a lot of hope in uh, local and global transformation if we can celebrate these kinds of leaders and these kinds of movements as much as we celebrate the violent ones. These people are a harbingers of a new non-violent global civilization. By using the word non-killing, we may become non-killing people. It first starts in the mind. The mind says, we can do it. It is possible. The reasonableness of humanity over time is slowly moving in that direction. We don't have to be pessimistic about that. The question is just get over the pessimism, to break through the assumption drag. The fact is that most people <laughs> never kill anyone and never have.